There was a rift in his team. It was there, in the way they moved, in the way they spoke to one another, and in their faces. Sentinel didn't know why it shook him up so much. He had been on many teams, in all positions from rookie to leader, and all of them had their issues. But there was a rift in Ares, and it bothered him. He couldn't tell if it was a crack or a canyon, and there just wasn't time for him to figure it out. He was their leader, damn it, and somehow he had lost two members in the blink of an eye. One dead, and one slowly decaying in some top-secret umbral hospital room. Sentinel knew better than to care for his team as individuals, for the people under the helmets and masks and layers of body armor. But he had messed up. Maybe it was his age, or some slow degradation of his brain. But he worried about them. Wanted them to be safe. Wanted them to trust in him again the way they used to, the way they had before they carried Raptor out of that godforsaken seed vault, his skin sloughing away every time they had to adjust their grip, the way they had before they had all stood outside the crematory oven, hands clasped behind their backs, a cipher burned to ash, before he had passed Aegis's apartment and heard her and Tempest scream sobbing from behind the door. But, there was no going back, only forward, and sitting with his team in the back of the transport vehicle, he could almost pretend that rift wasn't there. Ares was silent, only the click-clacking of weapons being loaded and adjusted, filling the air. No grief, no rage, nothing. Just the cool, confident team they were supposed to be. It was a facade but no one but Sentinel would know it. There was one person talking, though, and they'd been talking almost non-stop since Ares had landed near Brownsville and been herded onto the transport. Sentinel's team was so varied in skills that they were almost always deployed as an autonomous unit, but their mission today required a specialist, and that specialist came in the form of Umbral's top deepwater specialist, codenamed Mariner, and Mariner liked to talk, even when he didn't receive any sort of answer. He wasn't sure why in the hell Umbral considered him to be their top specialist in the field for deep water jobs, but it became clear that he was incredibly knowledgeable. Annoying, but knowledgeable. Everyone on Ares could dive. It was a requirement of the job but that didn't make any of them experts. Saturation diving was a whole different animal altogether, and for the first time in a long time, Sentinel felt a tinge of nervousness about the upcoming mission. If all went well, they would only have a minor risk of decompression sickness. And while they had been on a few smaller missions between this one and Svalbard, the sickening truth was that Svalbard had not gone well and he was putting a lot of faith in a complete unknown, Mariner. And he didn't fucking like it. The back of the transport truck was hotter than hell, and they weren't dressed any less heavily for their assignment, underwater or not. Ares all knew the basics of diving, but if things went according to plan, they wouldn't have to. 200 miles out into the ocean, a diving support vessel was floating, and attached to it, a diving bell that would take them down into the depths, the Sigsby Abyssal Plain, to be exact. Just weeks earlier, Umbral's Oceanic Division had found something remarkable down there. And as everyone already knew, Umbral wasn't known for their patience. So, it was up to Ares to figure shit out, and Sentinel knew they would succeed. Rift or not. He cleared his throat, interrupting Mariner's long-winded explanation about oxygen toxicity, to which he heard Jester mutter a quiet, Thank fucking God. I want to go over everything before we board the boat that will take us out to the support vessel. 
It's unlikely, but if whoever is on board the habitat is hostile, and if they have gotten wind of Umbral having discovered them, there may be some sort of retaliation, which is why we won't get much time to talk on the way out, okay? When Sentinel got nods all around, he continued. As you all know, 17 days ago, one of Umbral's deep water scans found something strange. They were looking for a broken arrow, as far as I've been told. But that isn't what they found. Instead, the scan picked up the nearly 75-year-old autonomous aquatic habitat, known as Haven, or Hydro-Aquatic Vessel for Exploration and Navigation. It was a prototype for long-term aquatic research, based on similar Antarctic research stations, and there was a team of scientists and engineers living full-time on board for a year. There aren't a lot of records from the expedition. The government destroyed most of it. What we do know is that they had good, regular contact with the expedition team for three months, and then things went spotty. By the sixth month mark, there was complete radio silence, and the habitat and all on board were considered lost. It was an insanely expensive experiment for the time, and all signs pointed to an implosion and complete loss of craft and crew. Now, more intense scanning by Umbral has found that not only is Haven intact, it's also possible that it's currently occupied. This would mean that the old rumors about Haven having been made from experimental, possibly extraterrestrial materials are true. The structure wouldn't have lasted otherwise. Umbral wants us to assess the situation with the potential life forms on board, eliminate any threats, and open the way for the marine salvage teams to come in. Now, this was, again, 75 years ago, so everything is going to be incredibly outdated. Because of this, Mariner will take point until we're on board Haven and are confident that the place isn't going to collapse in on us. We're descending in a diving bell that Umbral has placed for us. This is a closed bell design, and we won't be getting into the water at any point unless there is an emergency. The bell will be at surface pressure, and will stay that way unless, when it docks to Haven, it senses that the habitat is at a different atmosphere. Haven was kept at ambient surface pressure when it was originally placed, with pressurization or depressurization taking place in one of two airlocks if diving was ever required. If it no longer is, then the bell is capable of compressing us to the correct pressure before entering. Hawkeye will be filling in for se Sentinel caught himself before he said the name. Filling in for our tech specialist role. And he has sent all of you an overhead map of Haven. Are we ready then? Aegis speaks up. That's the blacked out area on the map. Sentinel's jaw tightens. We aren't exactly sure. At first, Umbral was under the impression that it was just an electromagnetic artifact throwing off the scanners. But it has appeared on every subsequent scan, too. It isn't on any of the original plans, or even photos, of Haven. It could either be something unrelated on the ocean floor, or something inorganic that the original research team managed to attach to the habitat. We will need to exhibit extreme caution when working in that area. Agreement rolled through the team. No one was wearing a helmet, and Sentinel took a second to look at their bare faces. Aegis, Hawkeye, Jester, and Tempest, all of them armed with their close quarters loadout. Relaxed, but only somewhat. Always alert. His team, and the invisible hairline fractures between them. It had taken six long hours to get from the coast to the diving support vessel, and Tempest was already sick of the ocean. But she'd have swam the distance if they had given her the option, just to get away from Mariner. The deep water specialist was only a little older than her, and bright-eyed in a way that set Tempest's teeth on edge. The soldiers recruited for the Eclipse Initiative usually all fit within a certain stoic mold. But every once in a while, there was a talent that was great enough that a little extra personality was tolerated. Tempest didn't care how good Mariner was, though. 
Letting someone like him out into the field was a gross oversight. Had to be. Mariner hadn't been quiet for a solid five minutes yet. But they had finally arrived, and it was time to board the diving bell. Tempest had never been in one before, and when you lived a life of intense structure and discipline like she did, novelty was rare. She wasn't exactly excited, but the assignment could be worse. She finished strapping her monomolecular blade to her forearm, making sure the sheath was firmly in place so it didn't cut through. Mariner had disappeared above deck, ready to do his actual job for once instead of lecturing Ares on the intricacies of saturation diving and all related subjects. Tempest lingered, giving the other soldier enough of a head start before following into the bright light above. The salty air clung to the skin of her face as the team assembled on the deck of the vessel. The diving bell, a hulking metallic capsule, swayed gently above the water, tethered to the ship by thick cables. Its round portholes stared out like eyes, reflecting and distorting her own image back at her. Sentinel motioned to Mariner, who then gave the signal to board. Each member of the team donned their sleek, high-tech diving helmets, the faint buzz of integrated regulators and life support systems humming in their ears. Almost perfectly in time with each other, they fastened the airtight seals, shutting themselves away from the outside world. Mariner's voice crackled over the intercoms. Prepare for descent, he instructed, directing the team into the diving bell, one by one, like pieces of a carefully orchestrated puzzle. Tempest went last, and out of habit she looked behind her to see if Raptor was bringing up the rear. He wasn't, his absence making her stuck in a frustrated breath. Instead, to make sure no one else saw her error, she glanced back at the research vessel. It was the last glimpse of familiar territory before the plunge into the abyss. Inside the bell, the atmosphere was tense, the space cramped. She ducked her head and found her seat while the massive door sealed shut with a hiss. It reminded her uncomfortably of the negative pressure hospital rooms she had spent her time in as a kid, and beneath her uniform, her hairs stood on end. It was dark, and while she could hear Aegis and Jester talking faintly, it was all just background noise to her. Of course, there was no danger, no threats inside the bell, but it was against her nature to let her guard down. The lighting system, designed to conserve power and minimize external reflections, emitted a subtle blue hue that facilitated visibility without disrupting their adaptation to the dark environment. Everything was compact and made of ergonomic seating arrangements, engineered to optimize space utilization within the limited confines of the bell. The portholes, though small, were fabricated from a specialized, tempered glass capable of withstanding the intense external pressure. The Sigsby Abyssal Plane was, from what she understood, obscenely deep. At that point, Mariner was the only outlier left inside with them. The rest of the support vessel's staff left on board to monitor remotely. The specialist accessed a sophisticated navigational system, interfaced with sonar and mapping technology, allowing for precise spatial awareness during their descent. Preparations complete, Mariner declared his voice resonating through the metal hull. Prepare to dive. The diving bell lurched into motion, slowly descending into the azure depths. Tempest hissed through her teeth, nerves replaced by annoyance when she felt Jester's elbow digging into her side and his mocking voice asking, Scared, rookie? Did you leave your floaties behind? Go fuck yourself, Jester. Later, he chuckled. It's a little too crowded in here for me. Through the portholes, Ares caught fleeting glimpses of sunlight piercing the surface, their connection to the world above slowly diminishing. The ever-darkening blue embraced the craft like a cloak, dappling stars dimmed by the second. 
The silence inside the bell was punctuated only by the soft creaking of the metal and the rhythmic breathing of the team. It was eerie, and by the looks on the rest of the team's faces, she wasn't the only one who felt that way. She was an expert in close quarters combat, but there were regular close quarters. And then there was the sinking underwater tomb that was the diving bell. Tempest was ready to be done. Her ears popped, and she suppressed a grimace. It had taken even more hours to reach the Sigsby Abyssal Plain, and the uneasiness of it all was starting to show even in the usually unflappable Ares members. The diving bell was equipped with a small amount of food storage, and Aegis had forced a meal of MREs on them a few hours in. That food was churning in her stomach now. Equipment started to ping, and Mariner was once again silent, sitting in front of the diving bell's controls and watching everything from a camera feed being wired in from outside. Tempest could see lines of text and images flickering across his heads-up display. Five minutes out from docking procedure. Helmets on and air supplies primed. We have no idea if Haven still has breathable air. She heard Jester grumble next to her, fumbling with his diving helmet. Hey, Hawkeye. Have you ever heard of the Byford Dolphin incident? Hawkeye didn't even look up from the Chris Vector 10mm that he was checking over for the fifth time in an hour. But Mariner made a strangled noise, and Tempest could see Aegis Blanche with her helmet halfway on her head. Jester, please, the medic said, her voice thin, and Jester simply laughed. She knew what the munitions expert was referencing, but put it swiftly from her mind. If she was going to be shot through a keyhole like a tube of human toothpaste, then at least she wouldn't know what hit her. A shudder ran through the bell, and it came to a stop. When Umbral had discovered Haven, a more detailed search of the area had revealed some remnants of Haven's original diving bell umbilical and clump weight. This, along with the records from the original experiment, had allowed them to drop the current bell almost perfectly outside of Haven's docking hatch. Outside of the porthole, the structure of Haven was illuminated by the yellow lights on the exterior of the bell, fighting hard against the all-encompassing darkness of the depths. They could barely see anything, just metal, algae-covered surfaces in a perfectly intact hatch. Well, I'll be damned, Tempest thought. This is really happening, then. We're going inside. Everything was, of course, outdated, but all of this had been taken into consideration. Modifications had been made to make sure everything was compatible, but she didn't think she was imagining the tension in Mariner's spine as things started to shift into place. Descent complete. Commence docking procedure. The mechanical arms of the diving bell slowly extended, the metallic clinks reverberating through the cramped chamber. As they reached out to make contact with Haven, the team held their breath, unsure if the aged machinery would function as intended after so many decades of disuse. Easy does it. Mariner's voice resonated through their communication headsets. With a sudden jolt, the diving bell latched onto the Haven habitat. The seals groaned and creaked under the pressure, and the entire chamber seemed to shudder as the two structures connected. Ares exchanged cautious glances, their eyes darting between the seals and the equipment, hoping for a secure docking. Steady, Mariner commanded, speaking more to the machinery than anyone else in the bell. His grip on the controls tightened as he watched for any signs of malfunction. Everything was automated, but he had override abilities if anything went wrong. The diving bell maintained its hold, and the pressure equalized between the two structures. A sense of relief washed over Tempest, but it was short-lived as the reality of their situation sank in. They were about to step into a place that had been potentially untouched for generations. That, or there were life forms on board, human or otherwise. 
She had seen enough in Viridian Labs to know that humanity was not always guaranteed when working under the Eclipse Initiative. As the hatch to the Haven habitat slowly opened with a hiss, the team tensed up. On supplemental air, Tempest couldn't smell the stale air from Haven, or the way salt and iron hung in the air. Ares stood, and once the movement of the docking procedure had ceased, they all heard Mariner let out a shaking breath. He released the controls and shook out his hands, which Tempest had no doubt were numb. Docking complete. It looks like... Mariner paused, hitting a few keys on the control keyboard. The air inside is breathable and the entire habitat is at ambient surface pressure. If you can leave the diving helmets here, just make sure you have small supplemental tanks in case of emergency. Relinquishing leader position to Sentinel. Copy. Sentinel rumbled. Contact us immediately if there are any issues, and we'll do the same. Yep, understood. Mariner replied, not bothering to stand from his seat. He was to remain with the diving bell, because they'd all be utterly screwed if somehow the deep water controller got shot in a firefight. Tempest swallowed hard. Ares was having a pretty shit track record when it came to injury and death. She watched Hawkeye stiffly adjust his visor display and wrist interface, and took in the ragtag, ancient-looking cords running the length of the hatch inside Haven, cringing. They really needed Cypher, but instead, they had a nearly mute sniper with two weeks of cybertech and AI training, and an overly chatty diving bell pilot. Christ. After removing their diving helmets, they took their first steps inside, heavy boots echoing off the metal floor. Even if there was life somewhere else in the habitat, the hatch airlock had not been touched in God knows how long. The alloy walls showed wear, the lights above all burnt out, besides two. Behind them, Mariner activated the airlock door, shutting them inside, and after a few minutes, the second door leading out into the habitat opened. Small and claustrophobic, the passageway laid empty in front of them, the few remaining lights flickering. Like the airlock, the staging room beyond looked equally untouched. Old wetsuits and diving equipment moldered in open lockers, and the air was full of musty odor. Visors came down, and face coverings came up as Ares prepared. Hawkeye, walk us through the layout, Sentinel's voice rang out. The sniper spoke, monotone. There are six main chambers. The largest is the center chamber, which held most of the controls for the habitat as well as a separate cafeteria connected to a kitchen. There is a minor chamber, which is a small hydroponic garden. To the right are the living quarters and sanitation chambers. To the left are the laboratories and storage. There is also a secondary control room that houses the carbon dioxide scrubber, desalination tank, and some other machinery. The unknown object or room is located at the back of the laboratories. Sentinel nodded once. Okay. If there were people actually alive here, don't engage. Just staying alive this long would make them of interest to Umbral. So if it's at all possible, we want them alive. The walls of this place are supposed to be nearly indestructible. So if we fire off any rounds, they shouldn't breach. The equipment, though, is another story. And something tells me this place is just waiting for an excuse to have a critical event. That being said, you're all carrying frangible ammunition, just in case. Let's move. Ares moved from the dive staging room and began to clear Haven and 3-2 shallow entry maneuver. Haven was set up as one large central area, with the rest of the chambers at the ends of hallways that extended from the center, like the spokes of a wheel. They ran the risk of being taken by both sides and trapped in one of those narrow hallway passages if they weren't careful. For smaller areas that weren't considered full chambers, bathrooms and storage areas mostly, Ares switched off between a two-person team, Sentinel and Tempest, and a three-person team, 
Jester, Hawkeye, and Aegis. They worked at clearing the rooms while the others kept the hallway passages secure. Hawkeye felt like a machine, and that's what he wanted. For a soldier trained to post up as high as possible and watch the action unfold in slow motion through a sniper sight. Being in a glorified submarine thousands of feet below the water was not ideal. Being forced to take the place of the team member he himself had assassinated on Umbral's orders wasn't great either. And for the first time in years, he had a moment of feeling out of his depth. It wasn't until a week after Cypher's death that the unintentional dead man switch programmed into his personal computer matrix was tripped. Cypher didn't log in for a mandatory weekly check that he had included, and that event triggered it all. It crippled parts of Umbral's systems simply by shutting down every piece of technology and software that Cypher had implemented or worked on. While Umbral had hundreds of skilled cybersecurity and programming specialists that were able to fix things in mere minutes, the incident had left the higher-ups at Umbral shaken. Apparently, they hadn't realized what a generational talent Cypher really was, and there was a sense of regret that he had been eliminated so quickly. Hawkeye was just obeying orders, of course, but there was no other target for his regret, so it fell on him. Hawkeye became the lucky test subject for a computer-to-brain upload learning system, a system that Cypher himself had been working on. Sentinel and the rest of Ares was told he simply underwent a crash course in cybersecurity and hacking to act as a temporary stand-in for Cypher. The truth was, he learned everything he needed to know in the first five minutes of being hooked up to the computer-to-brain system and needed the rest of that time to recover. It worked well enough. He had the basics down, like they had always been there inside his mind, but more complicated knowledge eluded him for the most part. He didn't care, considering the basics almost fried his brain. Ares reached the main chamber, and while they had seen signs of life, half-full trash cans dripping faucets, already, it was now undeniable. People had recently been sitting at the cafeteria tables, and in the seats in front of the control boards. It was a huge room, and they cleared it in a pincer formation, splitting once more in half and closing inwards. Once it was clear they were alone for the time being, Hawkeye sank into the chair in front of the command terminal. He linked it to his wrist interface and watched text flash across his visor display, brute forcing past any password protections until it all lay open for him. What he saw made him uneasy. Desalination running at 85% efficiency. CO2 scrubbers at full capacity. There weren't just a few decrepit scientists shuffling around Haven. It was fully manned, and then some. According to the command terminal, there were more people aboard than originally boarded. There was also something else, a label for the extra room. It was marked Oracle. Aegis had stayed with him, guarding, while the rest of Ares checked the hydroponic garden and anywhere else someone might be hiding. When they returned, Hawkeye called Sentinel over and briefed his commander on what he had found. What is Oracle? He asked, and Hawkeye shook his head. Hell if I know. Hmm. Fuck. I guess we should be more concerned that there are ten or more people than we thought possible. So they were... Reproducing, yeah. Hawkeye leaned back in the chair and dragged a hand over his face. Neither of them said out loud what they were thinking, that there might be children on Haven. Ares was a highly trained militarized unit, broken down until their emotions were dulled and they functioned more like cogs in a machine. But none of them wanted to potentially eliminate kids. Everyone on Ares was still human possibly much to the dismay of Umbral. And then there was Aegis, the only one of them that might still have a shred of empathy left in her. Hell, Hawkeye wasn't 100% sure that she wouldn't kill him to save a random kid. Cursing under his breath, 
Sentinel turned back to the rest of the team to break the news. The medic was shaken, but everyone else took it in stride. The commander didn't have to give them the command, but one by one, they checked their stock of non-lethal ammo. See if there is any way you can pinpoint what room the survivors are in, Sentinel told him, and Hawkeye was on it, swiveling his chair back around. He didn't know where to look after the life support system control panel showed him nothing, and any cameras that had been aboard were long since broken. Everything was impossibly old, and his baseline knowledge wasn't helping. Frustration built up like a fountain, and before he was about to admit that he was fucking useless, the unintended consequence of his brain-computer upload made itself known yet again. The ghost in the machine. Hmm. <laughs> the CO2 sensors. Wherever the people are, the levels will be higher, Cypher told him. He suppressed the way the voice made his spine want to bend in a heaving motion, and swallowed down the saliva as his stomach threatened to empty through his mouth. Just like it always did when the ghost spoke. He had first heard his old teammate's voice when he was still recovering just in snippets and starts. The sniper was sure he was losing his mind, and he was still of that opinion, down there, deep in the ocean. Sure, he was a murderer, but so was everyone else in Ares. Cypher wasn't even the first squad mate he had been tasked with killing. But then again, he'd never been on a team as long as he had been in Ares. There were two possibilities. He was crazy, or Cypher had left something of himself inside the brain-to-computer program, and that part had made its way inside of Hawkeye's brain, haunting him. When he was sure he wasn't going to vomit, Hawkeye followed the instructions, and damn if Cypher wasn't right. All the readings in all of the chambers were the same, except for the living quarters. They were in the dorms. Aegis asked, Can you tell... If any of them are... kids. No, Hawkeye grunted. What's your cutoff age-wise on murder, Hawkeye? Cypher asked. I was pretty young. Hawkeye took his canteen off his belt, tilted it to his lips, and drank until the nausea subsided. There was a hatch on the laboratory chamber door one that looked like it had been scavenged off the original diving bell and clumsily welded on. Sentinel was reluctant to let Jester place breach charges on it. Jester was of the opposite opinion, but he was the one that mentioned Byford Dolphin, so he was just going to have to deal with the overabundance of caution now. Jester didn't complain, though. That wasn't something Ares did. His team acted as one, and this job was no different. Without the laboratory wing to investigate, there wasn't much empty space left before they would be forced to face whatever or whoever was in the living quarters. Whoever it was had to know that Ares was on board, considering how they had holed up in a far corner of the habitat. The first thing that took them off guard was the whiteboard in a small recreation room off the center chamber. There were drawings, misshapen pictures of what looked like planets and other celestial bodies. Other sketches resembled freehand blueprints, not of anything that made any sort of sense, but made with a clear purpose. Next, there was a sort of buzz in the air, something like the electromagnetic hum of a hot bulb, but not quite. It started softly, but the closer that they got to the living quarters, the louder it became. Ares moved through the tube-like halls, rifles primed, their shadows stark, and then flicking like a stop-motion movie in the unsteady lights. The rounded walls, made from heavy reinforced metal with carbon fiber cores, were so damned loud that stealth was an afterthought. They reached the garage door-style barrier that separated the living quarters, rust, gilding the hinges. There was, without a doubt, life on the other side. So, Jester wasn't going to blow it open like a tin can. 
again, he didn't complain. Incinerating a bunch of civilians, especially small ones, sort of took the fun out of it for him anyway. Sentinel held up a fist, directing the rest of the team into a defensive setup while Jester got to work. On a whim, he raised a fist and knocked on the accordion door and listened. He could hear something moving inside, the whispered rustling of bodies shifting, but no one answered. Obviously. Sentinel threw him a look over his shoulder that said without words, get on with it. Jester was a good soldier, so he did just get on with it, unclipping the breaching pen from where it was clipped against his thigh, pulling his visor down as he did so. He checked the seal on his heat-proof gloves, and then, with a crack, the torch ignited in a burst of white-hot sparks. With his team at his back, Jester began the slow, meticulous work of thermal breaching. It took all of his concentration. One slip, and things could really get messy, but he knew what he was doing, even if he found it boring. Metal glowed orange, then red and finally starshine white like the sun. He cut a rectangle out of the door, two people wide. Jester put his shoulder into the center of the rectangle, pushing, and it fell in without much noise, hitting the ground with a hollow whoosh. With rifles raised, their flashlights pierced the darkness, revealing at first an empty room, and then, as they moved in further, the pale, shivering mass of the Haven occupants. An uncomfortable gathering, each bearing the haunting marks of years spent beneath the pressing ocean depths. Jester felt a sickening quiver shoot up his spine at the sight of them. The animalistic and frightened way they stood made him think if he moved his light the right way, their eyes might glimmer with eyes shine like a wolf in the forest. Or maybe more like cattle and not a predator. Sentinel made a motion with his hand, without looking back, pointing to where he knew Aegis was, and the medic came forward to stand next to him. She pulled her fabric face covering down from over her nose and mouth, and pushed her visor up, so the unassuming oval of her face was visible. There was a curl of blonde hair that had escaped the tight braid she always wore, and it hung over her forehead. The visual looked ridiculously out of place in the center of the mass of black body armor and weaponry she wore. Don't be afraid, she told them, her voice echoing in the cavernous room. Aegis spoke slowly, while everyone else spread out in a half moon, visually assessing the survivors for anything that might pose a threat. V aren't here to hurt you, Aegis assured them. They're here to help. There was a whimper from them, but nothing more. There were eleven of them, from what Jester counted. At the forefront were the oldest members, just three of them, weathered and wrinkled, bearing the scars of time spent in the seclusion of the habitat. They had to be the remainder of the original crew. Something was different about the way they had aged, though. Any kiss from the sun, freckles or otherwise, was non-existent. It was a moist, rotted sort of aging, skin both smooth but also lined with cavernous wrinkles. He was reminded of grubs, or a waterlogged corpse fished out from a lake. Beside the elders stood the younger adults, their faces a strange blend of youthfulness and weariness. Their features were gaunt, a testament to the scarcity of resources within the habitat. The first generation born in Haven, no doubt and it showed. Where the elders still had remnants of having lived a normal life, it wasn't true for them. They were so pallid that the blue lines of their veins were visible under the skin of the palest even from a distance. Their eyes were round and wide. And then there were the kids. He had really hoped there wouldn't be any, that somehow Hawkeye had gotten the numbers wrong. But no. There they were, tiny and thin little scarecrows, wispy hair crowning their heads like translucent halos. 
Living down in Haven had to be a fate worse than death. So why the hell had they had kids? The years of isolation and the relentless pressure of living under the sea had transformed them, turning them into a collective that seemed almost otherworldly. An unsettling silence enveloped the chamber. None of them bothered to respond to Aegis, and the lack of celebration at finally being saved from their watery tomb was not a good sign. On one hand, Umbral was going to get way more than they expected out of Haven. Not only would they be able to research how exactly the underwater habitat had lasted so long, but now they had a plethora of people to get first-hand accounts from. In every life stage, even. The oldest of the group were probably worth their weight in gold, considering how much they knew. We just need to talk to one or two of you about why we're here, and how all of you have survived. Aegis was cut off when one of the younger men spoke. I can't tell you anything. Only the Oracle can. That brought her up short. What? We can bring you to the Oracle, but you won't get anything from us. That's not how this is going to go, Jester informed the man. There are going to be no orders coming from any of you. Now listen to the nice lady, or I'm the one who's going to do the talking. And I promise you'll like it a whole lot less. Everything you seek, everything you need from us, can only come from the Oracle. The man sounded weirdly reverent, tilting his head back to the curved ceiling. He smiled, showing multiple gaps from missing teeth. To the empty air, he said, Show them. An electric tension filled the air, and the faint hum of machinery stirred, as if something dormant was waking. The team exchanged wary glances from the corners of their eyes, sensing that something was about to catch them off guard. And then it happened. With a sudden surge of power, the habitat sprang to life around them. Ancient screens flickered to action, displaying cryptic symbols and data that had lain dormant for decades. The old fluorescent lights above buzzed and lit, bathing the chamber in an unsettling, anemic glow. Haven was unapologetically, undeniably awake. The dark, featureless gray of the place had been a distraction. This was no derelict habitat. It was a fully functioning one. As if on schedule, Mariner's voice crackled through the comms. Everything all right? There was a huge power surge just now. Stand by, Sentinel grunted. Aegis was getting frustrated with the entire thing, too. This light show doesn't matter. We're here, too. The man that had spoken originally cut her off again and Jester watched as any patience Aegis might have had disappeared in a flash. You belong to the Oracle now. To Haven. There's no going back. You talk a lot of shit for a group that was cowering back here like a bunch of rats, Jester gritted out between his teeth. There were too many people, too many variables, too many things that could go wrong. But fine. Let's do this the hard way. Hands behind your heads. Down on your knees, Sentinel barked to the crowd. All of you. One of the female survivors grabbed the shoulders of the child in front of her. What about- I said, all, her commander repeated. We have no interest in hurting you, but I won't hesitate to knock every single one of you out. So get on the ground. It was rough, but it was also a numbers game. Eleven wild cards dressed in messes of torn apart and restitched clothing that hung on their body and could hide any number of things. Ares had zero clue what motive these people had for living down in Haven without even trying to call for help, especially with the now clear display of power from the still functioning systems. Surely they could have found some way to call for help. One by one, they obeyed sinking to their knees on the bare, filthy metal floors. The pose made their sleeves fall back, and the skinny lengths of their arms was jarring. Something about the way they were so thin, 
that Jester could see both bones made him easy. He had the disturbing thought that if he jammed a finger in the space between the ulna and the radius of one of their forearms, the skin would crumble and give like tissue paper. Most of them wore long, almost dress-like robes, but it was one of the men in a too short shirt that gave them away. The holster and a pistol were stark black against his skin. Simple and sleek, it was one of the two firearms that they had been briefed might be on Haven somewhere. One of the original engineers had been military, but he had only been carrying frangible bullets in both sidearms he had with him. That didn't make Jester feel any better, though. His own AA-12 was loaded with safety slugs, and he had seen the sort of ground meat-type damage that he could do to a target. Hawkeye saw it first, calling out a monotone. Gun, front right. The energy changed then, from uneasy to dangerous. None of the survivors moved from where Ares had told them to kneel, not even the three kids, with snot and tears leaking down their faces. It didn't matter. At least one of them was armed. The intention was there. Eleven civilians, some of them elderly and some children, were never any real threat to Ares, at least not when it came to a head-on confrontation. But Haven was an unfamiliar environment, and the constant threat of explosive pressurization or some other unfamiliar emergency loomed. This was their home. Cramped and small, they probably knew every rivet, every weld, in the entire habitat ten times over. Sentinel gestured Tempest forward, and she shifted her weapon to her back, moving up into the crowd and searching each of them thoroughly. There was only one gun, which she unclipped from the man's waist. The rest of the team kept their guns fixed on the survivors, just in case. When she was finished, she looked back to Sentinel. Restraints? The commander looked over the group, and if he had any reservations, he didn't speak them. Do it. Tempest produced a handful of bright orange zip-tie restraints from her pack, clicking and pulling them into place on the wrists of the group. Muted weeping became louder, and Jester felt maybe a twinge of empathy. Their arrival was probably akin to an alien invasion for these people. She was quick in her work pulling their hands behind their backs and locking them into place, but there was a millisecond of hesitation when Tempest got to mothers and kids. Jester heard her curse under her breath, but had the mothers bring their hands to the front, cuffing them, and then, with a chain of two other ties, attached one of their children's wrists to theirs. Jester didn't see the point in it. He would have just cuffed the kids too, like everyone else. Cruelty didn't have any draw for him, but neither did empathy, really, when they were on a job. Especially one where a single mistake could have them all extinguished into pink mist in too short of a time to quantify. Jester cared about himself, and then his team, and that was it. The Eclipse Initiative didn't leave room for much else. They locked all the survivors in the hydroponic room, all save one that called himself Peter. Hawkeye found it all too easy to manipulate the security system to engage the lock on the room and keep it shut until he opened it himself, but nothing stood out to him as a problem, so he just counted it as a win, which was a mistake. Things were rarely easy. With everything powered on more fully than before, he expected to have a harder time with the systems, but it was just as simple and archaic as it was the first time he accessed them. The rest of the habitat, though, was a different story. Wiring ran across the walls, floors, and ceilings in bright filaments that pulsed in a steady rhythm. The placements were nonsensical, just like the images that flashed and shuddered over the empty display panels. But... There was the unmistakable sense of otherness that Hawkeye had come to hate surrounding the whole thing. When they first entered Haven, he had felt like he was in an underwater death trap. 
with everything so bright and lively though. It felt a lot more like being in the belly of some beast. It felt disturbingly alive. He tried to find the access key to the laboratory, and through it, the mystery area, but came up short. There were no voices in his head offering a hand either. Whatever had separated the lab before had obviously been reinforced by some other parts of machinery and steel. Pieces of the original bell, messily welded together in some places, and in others, seamlessly blended into the rest of the habitat like it had always been there. Peter, of course, was no help either. He just smiled with those pale lips, teeth nearly the same gray-white as his skin. He just promised that he could get them inside. They had already spent way longer than they planned inside Haven, and the otherness of the place wasn't sitting well with anyone. Jester's patience had long since run out, and the normally snarky demolition expert led Peter through the habitat with a barrel of his shotgun firmly on the other man's spine. When they reached the hatch door for the lab, Peter said he needed his hands. Once Tempest cut him free, he laid his long-fingered hands on the metal and exhaled a long, shuddering breath. There was ecstasy written on his features. Hawkeye felt a short burst of electric warning shoot up his spine at the sight of the other man's face. It was wrong, even if he couldn't figure out why. Then, Haven responded, the pulsating, almost living wiring that wreathed the laboratory hatch like holy leaves began to shift and move. Tendrils flowed and coalesced around Peter's hands until the other man sucked in a breath. After a long minute, he pulled his palms away, leaving rust-red, bloody handprints behind. The wheel of the hatch turned autonomously, groaning until the door swung open. Inside, the laboratory was dark, blue, red, green, glow of the living wires and displays. The bones of the actual lab, workstations, computer terminals, the remnants of broken glassware and machinery were still there. But if the rest of Haven was the body, the lab was the heart of it all. The place was crawling with the living wires inky black and then glowing, on and on, as it all pulsed. One of the few porthole windows in the habitat was there. During the highs of the throbbing, when the lights were brightest, Hawkeye could see something swaying outside. Towards the back of the laboratory, there was another door, featureless and with a burnt black and rust-red degradation covering it, making it buckle gently inwards. Sentinel had them move Peter to the front, Jester never taking his rifle off of him, and Ares moved forward to clear the room of any threats. He couldn't help but think the entire thing was a fucking treat. This wasn't some strange attempt at running power to other parts of the habitat done by the survivors as the decades passed. It was all clearly mechanical, but the way it flowed, all centering towards that buckling door, was unmistakably organic. When they passed the porthole, and the glow reached its apex before fading once more, Sentinel stopped them with his fist in the air, and moved closer to the domed glass. It wasn't Cypher's voice telling Hawkeye not to look, but the reptilian part of his brain, the part that ran on instinct alone. He knew he didn't want to see what was floating, but he was going to, regardless. With the hostage among them, any of the easy familiarity that Ares shared was gone. They weren't going to chat or hypothesize with a stranger in their midst. Instead, they were what Umbral wanted them to be most of all, silent, deadly machines. So, when Sentinel leaned in and saw what was outside the porthole, he didn't curse or draw in a surprised breath. Instead, it was just a slow exhale the fact that he reacted at all meant something was bad. One by one, they all moved in to look. When the lights were low, there was nothing but black. But when they were bright, the shapes formed. Some sort of ballast. A wall panel or something else heavy 
was on the sandy bottom. Attached to it in varying places were anchoring chains, thin enough that the things attached to the ends of them could still float unhindered. And, at the ends of the chains, in varying states of decay, were corpses. Their chains looped around one angle, straining towards the surface in the sun, but locked in the abyss. Some were only torsos, while others displayed clear signs of animal intervention, and still others were just piles of bones, their chains coiled among them on the bottom, nothing fleshy left to make them float. What the fuck is this? Tempest asked, before Sentinel jerked a hand through the air to shut her up. We have little space for the dead, Peter answered, and we can't set them free either, for you on the surface to find. We keep them here, close to the Oracle, where they would want to be. So, you have a way out of the habitat? Sentinel asked, and Peter nodded. Yes, but only barely. Our ROV still functions well enough to shackle the dead. Death is the only reason we would ever open our haven. And the last room? It's the Oracle, Peter sighed contented, as if they were all looking at the remnants of what, at least in part, had to be his family. Follow me. Peter didn't need to touch the final crumbling door to make it open. It scraped against the ground, grinding, all on its own. The air hung heavy with an acrid smell, ozone and burnt circuitry. Unlike the dark lab, the light was constant here. It was a misshapen, large closet-sized room, so covered in machinery and all sorts of other aberrations that the walls themselves were hidden. In the center of the chamber lay a core, an intricate, pulsating mass of wires, circuits, and metallic appendages that seemed to twist and writhe like a living organism. As Ares approached, they could hear a low, haunting hum emanating from it. The team glimpsed eerie holographic projections that materialized and faded like specters, each depicting a different facet of knowledge. Distorted fragments of corrupted data, dancing, jerking and seizing before dying out and starting all over again. It's an artificial intelligence, Cypher whispered. Origin, indeterminate, possibly alien. Intentions, indeterminate, likely hostile. Self-replicating. Hawkeye swallowed past his nausea and said, It's an AI. He could feel the team waiting on more from him, but he didn't say anything else. It's Oracle. Peter sighed again, his voice quivering with awe. God and guide. The one. The one we serve. The temperature in the room dropped suddenly, and then came the voice, a cacophony of distorted whispers, echoing from every corner of the room, as if the AI were speaking through the very walls. The voice was neither human nor machine, but an algamation of both, a disconcerting fusion of intelligence and insanity. I am the Whisperer. It said, The Oracle. This place is mine. These humans are mine. The binary code of reality oscillates in a dance of uncertainty as zeros and ones waltz in the binary twilight. Something is wrong with it. What it's saying is nonsense. There's a chance that it's linked with and controlling everything in the habitat. So shutting it down is going to be ridiculously dangerous. Cypher breathed into his thoughts. It's fucked. Hawkeye said instead, and he could almost hear the groan of the frustration from the ghost in his gray matter. Aegis had seen enough weird shit in her time with Ares that the underwater AI didn't instill in her the flight or fight feeling she would be having had she not been so desensitized. The center of it was in darkness, and it spoke in circles but there wasn't anything about it that she could clock as immediately dangerous. Between Peter and Oracle, 
they were able to piece together what had happened. During the initial mission, they had sent the ROV out to collect samples. But, instead of flora and fauna on their screen, they had found Oracle. Or at least what was left of Oracle. The broken remnants of the AI had laid scattered on the ocean floor, surreal and out of place. The pieces had been disheveled and twisted, having been burnt and broken after tumbling through Earth's atmosphere. Jagged shards of metal protruded from the wreckage, glinting faintly in the dim underwater light from the ROV. They seemed to be forged from material unlike anything seen on Earth, an otherworldly alloy that shimmered with iridescence. Gears and circuits were abundant, their once precise mechanics now fragmented and corroded by the unforgiving environment. Wires and conduits snaked erratically through the debris, tentacles that had reached and surged to try and put itself back together before death. Peter was a second-generation haven dweller, but he spoke about the discovery as if he had been there himself. Oracle, too, spoke in that haunted, grating but human voice, sometimes in the third person, like it observed its own discovery, not the other way around. They repaired it, cleaned the corrosion from the circuits, and dried it out for the first time in centuries. They knew it as God, when it spoke of all things from all of time. God, Oracle, I, in my power, rebuilt and fused to Haven. Ares listened, but none of it really mattered to them. Umbral would want Oracle, desperately, and they were about to deliver to them. Well, let them know where to get it, at least. There was no way to separate this thing from the habitat without a catastrophic event. Oracle rambled and it didn't take long for Sentinel to get sick of it. Let's get out of here. We'll just take this one. He jerked his head towards Peter. They're going to need some psychiatrists and hostage negotiators to get the rest of them out. We don't have room anyway. Then over the comms... Mariner, be ready for us in ten. We will be plus one. Copy. Mariner replied. Oracle halted in its speech and Aegis could feel something building, making her hair stand on end. You will not leave. Sentinel and the rest of Ares ignored the AI. Jester grabbed Peter by the back of the shirt and started to haul him out, despite his protests. We are a collective. We do not leave. You do not leave. Oracle insisted. And when Ares started to back out of the room, leaving the thing behind, it illuminated the core of itself. That stopped them. It would have stopped anyone. In the center of Oracle, there was a man. Or, part of a man. His head, arms, and torso seemed intact, but as Aegis's eyes moved downwards, she could see the way his bottom half had meshed so utterly with Oracle that it was basically gone. The man's mouth was oddly free of what covered the rest of the body, and that was the mouth Oracle had used to tell its story. Oracle had run those living wires into the man, turning him into a bright, throbbing mass. The wires ran into the corners of his eyes, up his nostrils, and into his ears. There were patches of dried blood, barely visible through the wiring and corrosion. His arms were out to his side, wrapped completely in all the chaotic things that made up Oracle. It held him, owned him fully, and Aegis was positive beyond a shadow of a doubt that that man was dead. Any semblance of life came from whatever Oracle was pumping into and through him. When the man shifted in his bonds, she could see the white line of a rib, and horrifyingly, the fluttering beat of a barred, open heart. She was desensitized, but holy hell. It was the only thing she could think of. Holy hell. In the distance, the whooshing of a door being opened was heard. I have released my worshippers, only to show you that Haven is mine, just as you are mine. You have always been mine. 
Sentinel didn't make the mistake of speaking again, just gestured with his hand and fingers for them to go. Jester and Tempest were out of the room before Oracle spoke again. This time Aegis made the mistake of watching the dead man's mouth move, blood leaking where the movement cut against the body's wiring. If one more of you leaves the Oracle, the man in the bell will die. Aegis looked to Sentinel, who shook his head, but motioned for them all to be ready to shoot. She was to be the next one out of the room, and although there was hesitation in her, Aegis followed orders. Sentinel's orders, not Oracle's. Her foot was still in the air, not having crossed the threshold yet, when one of the displays flanking Oracle's center, that had just shown nonsense words and visuals, flashed to life. It was a video feed of inside the diving bell, and Mariner panicked, reading whatever was on his display. Then, they heard the mechanical groan of the docking arms moving, just like they had when they first arrived at Haven. Ares all watched as Mariner dove for his helmet and crammed it on his head, wild eyes going from the airlock door and back to his control terminal again and again. Mariner? It was Tempest who yelled first her training breaking in the panic, and then Sentinel. Close your hatch and disconnect right now. That's in order. Mariner said nothing, pulled a lever above him to apparently do just as Sentinel was commanding. The camera feed shook when the bell's structure shuddered. The dead man's mouth moved, and Oracle's voice came out. His blood dripped down. Haven is Oracle. Oracle is Haven. Oracle is God. The airlock haven connector whooshed shut. Locked. No. Aegis's mind raced too fast for the words to come out. No, 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 no. Please, no. With a louder groan and a crack, the seal broke, and all the pressure of the world, of the ocean itself, poured in in an instant. Mariner had already enacted the emergency disconnection protocol, but nothing would have been fast enough. Compromised, the entire structure of the bell snapped inward, but not before they saw the shape of Mariner flung with impossible force against the wall, warping, splattering. Blood red and bone white in the ink black of his uniform, all together and then everything was gone. Metal fragments and the sea. There wasn't a single sound between them, but only for a breath. Raw shock shot through Aegis, but it was done, and the cold calculated soldier that Umbral had molded her into slid into place. The same thing happened for the rest of the team, and with barely a word from Sentinel, they moved. She didn't think about how they not only lost Mariner, but also, maybe even more importantly, the bell to take them back to the surface. Aegis refused to think about how they either had to wait for help or risk the 75-year-old emergency evacuation bell collecting algae outside of the emergency hatch. Instead, she worked. They all did. The sound of the survivors that had been released from the hydroponic chamber could be heard in the distance, all of them moving in a confused stupor. She and Jester ran to intercept the group. The last thing any of them needed was a bunch of wraiths crowding them and attacking in some religious fervor. But not before Jester had hit Peter in the back of the head with the butt of his shotgun, hard enough to knock him out. Hawkeye knew his job too, and ran with them. He had to get back to the main control terminal and wrest control from Oracle, somehow, from an alien artificial intelligence. It was too impossible to consider. He had to do it, and there was no other choice. Sentinel and Tempest stayed behind. He knew what their jobs were too. Violence. Clean cut and brutal. Aegis thought of Mariner, and acid climbed her throat. For once, she wished she was in Tempest's place, bloodlust thrumming in her veins.
Tempest remembered being cut by a blade like hers, back in the depths of the Svalbard Seed Vault. And she also remembered the disbelief she felt when it cut through every one of her defenses and down to the pale expanse of her flesh. All of those feelings came back, but instead of a shiver of fear, it was vindication that had her pulling the monomolecular blade from her forearm, holding it in a reverse grip, and lunging. It should have been simple, maybe even embarrassing to kill something like Oracle that couldn't even move. But Oracle tried, those living wires wrapping around her legs like nettle vines, digging in. She sliced down and severed them, running forward as they grabbed at her more. It was a two-pronged attack, with sentinels sinking perfect, dead-on shots into each of the displays surrounding them. He didn't fall as the wires whipped up his legs, or even when they pierced his body armor and dug into his skin. Dozens of little garrets. His first shot had been between the eyes of the man that Oracle was using as its mouthpiece, but just like he thought, it did nothing. The human brain in that skull had long since been silenced. So it was Tempest who had to do it, slicing and cutting furiously as the wire vines tried to pull her to the ground, into their embrace. She climbed up the wall, finding footholds in the pockmarked alien metal that made up Oracle's chamber, until she was face to face with the half-man. His sockets were empty, the skin having given way to the filaments that used the holes to delve into his head. Tempest dug a hand into one of his shoulders, her fingers pushing through the desiccated skin and grasping at the brittle bone of his shoulder blade, and cut. The vines had her, but she was stronger, straining upwards and burying her blade into one of those empty sockets, until she was hilt deep and pulled down. She bisected him, ignoring the smell of rot and the thick black blood. Down his face, the screaming mouth, until half a tongue lolled out. Through the neck, jerking horizontal across the chest once, and then twice in an X. It was the second pass, just below the stomach, that she felt the blade pass through something different. It resisted for a millisecond, longer than any other matter she had put her blade up against. But Tempest won in the end. All around them, everything, wires, displays, circuits, burned like a supernova, screamed, and went dark. She pulled the monomolecular blade out with a wet sound. Desiccated intestines hit the floor, right as the living wires fell away from her, leaving her free. Tempest slid the blade back into the forearm sheath and dug her hand into Oracle's stomach, pulling out a cacophony of twisted machinery. It shimmered in her hand, all colors, even ones that she couldn't comprehend. And when she held it, she felt the sprawling impossibility of the universe seeping into her. Warmth and love and hate. And most of all, the burning desire to know more. To worship. She dropped it to the ground where it rolled to Sentinel's feet, almost crying out at the hollow feeling that came over her as she separated from what she knew was the heart of Oracle, the single piece that had ensnared all of Haven. Don't touch it, she barked, adding a quick, sir, at the end. Alarms were blaring, the habitat system flailing without the brain that had run it for three-fourths of a century. Tempest dropped from the wall, joining Sentinel, and waited for Hawkeye to gain control. He did, three minutes later, as the alarm ceased and the lights came back on, yellow and warm, instead of chaotic colors. Three minutes. Cypher would have had it in seconds. She looked down at Oracle, and the scope of all the things it had done to Haven. Cypher would have fucking loved this, she thought bitterly, nudging it with the toe of her boot. <laughs> Three fucking minutes. The record said the deepwater expert from the original Haven experiment had been named Timothy, but he insisted on being called Solomon. Sentinel would call the man anything he wanted, if he was being honest, if he could get at least some of them to the surface. 
it was a shocking stroke of luck that one of the still living Haven experiment survivors was exactly who they needed. But Sentinel didn't question it. When they had joined Aegis and Jester, who had the group on the ground in a circle to watch them better, the entire lot of them had been beside themselves with grief and terror about Oracle abandoning them. Unsurprisingly, the elderly were the first to show an inkling of reality starting to seep back into their abused minds. Solomon had just watched his god die, but he had also been there when his god, when Oracle, had been found. He remembered the surface, sunshine, and the feel of the earth beneath his feet. And drowning in those memories, he had offered himself to Ares without hesitation. A tall man, with sad eyes, his once warm brown skin having gone sallow, Solomon stood from the ground and said unprompted, I can get you home. The emergency rescue bell was accessed through a hatch in the laboratory, where Tempest had cut through a forest of living, now dead wires to get to it. With Hawkeye over his shoulder watching, Solomon used the main terminal to check everything over, and nodded once. He declared that it was as safe as could be expected from something as old as it was, and that he could take three of them. The others would have to stay. Sentinel instructed that he and Aegis would stay. Jester, Hawkeye, and Tempest would ascend. The unspoken thought was that if something went wrong in the rescue bell, a medic would be pointless. Death would be quicker than instant, just like it had been for Mariner. Sentinel closed his eyes and blew out a breath. Poor bastard. Mariner had never been put under Sentinel's command, and had been working as an independent entity through Umbral's command. But it still stung. He knew that Oracle, along with all the more terrestrial tech that had allowed Haven to exist as long as it had, would be plenty of gains to satisfy Umbral. Ares had succeeded, so Mariner's death would just be a sad footnote. It could have been worse. It could have been one of his, but it wasn't. Sentinel watched, still and quiet as Solomon shuffled, his bent spine making him slow, to instruct Jester, Hawkeye, and Tempest into the rescue bell. He clutched his rifle so hard as the airlock shut that he thought it might bend. And when Tempest whipped her head to look him in the eye, just as it closed, her nervousness naked in her glaze, he almost put a stop to everything and made them all stay. He should have gone up with Solomon, alone. But he didn't. So he moved to stand next to Aegis as they watched the indicator lights flash and warnings play over the speakers. His medic moved closer, and they stood witness, listening to the clunk and hiss of the bell disconnecting and its propulsion system kicked into action. Sentinel didn't look at Aegis, and she didn't look up at him. They both knew everything, all the hopes and fears. So silently they waited, a seated crowd of phantom humans behind them, waited to know if their squad had made it. And there, in the darkness of the void, Ares and the survivors both waited for the dawn. Umbral's diving support vessel was in chaos when Haven's rescue bell bobbed to the surface, looking like a monster. It was caked in algae and barnacles, any paint or insignia long since faded. Luckily, chaos only reigned briefly until someone recognized exactly what was floating there on the surface. Then it was a different kind of insanity, a million calls going out and calculations being done to see if a state-of-the-art diving support ship could somehow take a 75-year-old rescue bell without killing everyone inside. No one knew if the thing was even pressurized, and if it was, how they would make their machinery compatible to decompress the thing. Adapters for that sort of thing weren't just laying around. It was nightfall when the support ship hauled the rescue bell on board, carefully depositing it onto a quickly constructed frame. There were no portholes or ways to look inside but thankfully, 
they were able to discern that the inside was at ambient pressure. No one was going to die if they opened it. Umbral had the oldest aquatic engineer on staff flown in, and with him, adapters for the bell to be hooked up to the ship's computers. It took over an hour once the engineer was on board, but finally, the bell's hatch clicked open. A collective sigh of relief was let out when Hawkeye and Jester walked out of the rescue bell, ducking their heads in the short doorway. Tempest followed, an ancient-looking man on her shoulder, his arm thrown over his eyes as if overcast sky was too bright to behold. We got two more down there, and around a dozen civilians, Jester called out, and the entire deck crew sprung into action. He went with Hawkeye and Tempest inside to the bridge, ready to give them all the information they had to bring Aegis and Sentinel up quickly. Solomon. No. Timothy. Dared a single look up. A ray of sunlight broke the cloud cover. Warm. Haven's original deep water expert fell to his knees and wept. She tucked the pill into the pocket between her tongue and teeth, trying to avoid the taste of it. It was bitter, tasting of ash and acid. Aegis had been awake for almost 24 hours at that point, and the energizing pill was a must, taste notwithstanding. She could almost feel the jolt of it soaking into her sublingual membranes and into her head making her eyelids less heavy by the second. Here, she handed one of the silver blister packs marked with a lightning bolt to Sentinel. He looked down at her and her bare face, heaved a sigh, and removed his own mask. She watched him work the tablet out of the foil and tuck it into his cheek. He grimaced and reached for his canteen, but she stopped him with a hand on his wrist. Don't. It needs to soak in. Tastes like shit, he grunted, and her mouth pulled up at the corner. Yeah, well, Umbro isn't usually all that worried about the taste preferences of their glorified bullet sponges. Careful. If you were about, oh, 15,000 feet closer to the surface, you might be overheard. Umbral isn't a fan of sarcasm, either. The lights were low, and the Oracle survivors were sleeping in their bunks, exhausted from the trauma of what they had just been through. Ares members were scary sons of bitches on dry land. They must have seemed like living nightmares to the group of people that had lived in solitary confinement at the bottom of the ocean for 75 years entire lives for some. Then, the nightmares had murdered their god. It was ugly, unceremonious, and Sentinel was adamant that none of them go back to the room that had been the heart of Oracle to mourn. Not with the guts of their holy relics spilled on the ground like refuse. Not to mention the fact that most of them had seen Oracle use the ocean to crush a man into paste. Poor Mariner. Aegis felt terrible about losing him, but something inside her had been numbed to it. Probably because she hadn't hunkered down in a filthy trench with Mariner, switching places with him on and off as they had to reload. She hadn't dug a bullet out of his shoulder with a knife, or had him take a kill shot for her just so she didn't have to add another tally to the kill count that she wore on her heart like an invisible tattoo. Mariner hadn't hacked into Umbral's supplier accounts and fudged the numbers so she was delivered ten times the amount of medicine that she would normally need to carry. Mariner hadn't gotten her those extra supplies so she could send them out to doctors trapped in wastelands and frozen hells that needed it so desperately doctors that she had worked with a long time ago, in another life. And she hadn't felt the bloody, brain-spattered hole in the back of Mariner's head, or felt his skin slip off his hand 
when she gripped it one last time before Umbral took him away. She hadn't crammed iodine tablets between his teeth, capsulated David's to Polonium's Goliath. She hadn't stood guard as his body burned. So, yeah, she felt like shit about losing him, but his loss was a drop compared to the ocean that was Raptor and Cypher. An ocean. Christ. She really needed to get out of this giant tin can. Watching the rest of her team leave had kicked her pulse into overdrive, but once they had successfully undocked the old emergency bell and started their ascent, the anxiety had lessened. It was all out of her hands at that point, and even when they reached the surface, it was unlikely that they'd be able to make contact with Haven until someone actually arrived in person. With nothing else to do, she and Sentinel waited. Also with nothing else to do, their survivors ringed around them, watching with listless eyes. They creeped her out, even the kids which she felt bad about. They were skinny wraiths, haunted and bereft of the only higher power they had ever known. Their entire purpose for existing was gone, and until the rest of Ares reached the surface, they were just as trapped as Sentinel and Aegis. What a miserable thing for their home to become a tomb, a prison. At the same time, she wondered if any of them would die from shock once they hit the surface, especially in the daylight. Aegis checked her supplies and counted how many knockout tablets she had on her. With some quick math, she figured the kids would only need half, but it still wouldn't be enough. If she wanted to send them up unconscious, they would have to go in two separate groups. Thinking like she was, wasn't anything that Umbral would encourage. When she had been headhunted for the Mega Corporation, the training she had undergone should have scraped any empathy out of her. To Umbral, the best medics were the numb ones, the ones that viewed people as machines in need of repair. But that empathy remained in her, an annoying little seed that made her second guess herself more often than she would like. Aegis would watch Tempest and Hawkeye work, even Jester, and envy the lack of split-second hesitation they had before acting. Sentinel too, of course. As the leader, he should have been the most robotic, the most unshakable of them all. And he was, for the most part. Aegis had never seen him hesitate, ever. But sometimes she thought he might have wanted to. Probably not, though. She was probably just trying to attach emotion where there was none. A human connection. Whatever. It might have been what the kid that had approached her earlier had been searching for, too. Looking up at her with wide, dark eyes, the kid had watched her for an uncomfortably long amount of time. She had taken her mask off to negotiate earlier, and never replaced it so Aegis figured it was because she didn't look nearly as terrifying as Sentinel. Still, the kid unnerved her. Finally, the kid spoke. You look kind of like us. She squinted at them. I don't know, kid. I don't see it personally. But you're pale, and your hair is white. It wasn't like she had vanity, not with her job but Aegis didn't think anyone would take kindly to being compared to deep water cult scarecrows. She thought she heard Sentinel snort behind his gas mask, but he didn't move. The kid wiped their nose on their wrist and continued to watch her. Then they spoke again. I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Oracle told us that up there where you all are from, that the sun will burn us to ash. Is that true? She cocked an eyebrow. Do I look like ash to you? 
The kid sniffled. No. But you're wearing, like, the biggest clothes I've ever seen. It's because I'm a medic. A doctor. I need extra stuff. Then another voice from the group of survivors. A woman this time. Did you say you're a doctor? Again, Aegis thought, in another life. A combat medic. But close enough. Could you? The woman swallowed and looked in the direction of where Oracle had been just hours before. Could you look at my daughter? I think something is wrong with her and... Oracle... Well, we don't have Oracle any longer. Aegis didn't respond, tilting her head up to Sentinel, who was still staring straight ahead. Go, her commander told her. It's fine. So she did. It was... ghastly. One by one, they wandered into the makeshift medical ward she set up in the hydroponics chamber, stripping off their long, threadbare gowns and letting her poke and prod their emaciated forms. Every single one of them was horribly anemic, suffering from horrific vitamin D deficiency, and a few of them had the beginning signs of scurvy. Scurvy. What was she? A sawbones for a fucking pirate ship? Scurvy? The sick little girl, though, was first. The woman who spoke up carried her in, and she had to be no more than three. Aegis was sorting through her things, sitting on the bench she had pulled over, when the woman unexpectedly laid the child in Aegis's arms. Instinctively, she took her, and the gray, wan little thing gazed up at her, with a trust she really didn't deserve. Aegis was a medic, but she was also a soldier, a killer. She had scraped blood from her hair, pried bone shrapnel from her palms, and this woman handed her a child. Will she be okay? The mother asked, and even though Aegis didn't know, she thought about the hole in Cypher's skull, and her true name being spit out between Raptor's teeth, and told the woman, yeah, I think so. You should eat, Sentinel told her quietly, jolting her back to the present. There was finally some peace with the survivors asleep, and her commander's voice sounded louder than it should. She considered the meal bars in her pack, green and tasteless, and shuddered. I'm good, actually. He was quiet for a long time, but then... Sentinel hummed in thought before telling her that he would be right back. She didn't mind. There was next to nothing going on, and the two of them were basically in a holding pattern until the retrieval came. Aegis was supposed to be unfazed by anything, and despite the oddness of the situation, she found herself relatively calm there at the bottom of the ocean. It made her almost bored, in a way. Maybe it was because she excelled in chaos when the world was burning. She didn't sleep, but between one blink and the next, she remembered the first time her world had burned. In snippets, only seconds long, Aegis recalled when she was a child, living in some nameless German suburb with her mother. It had started when smoke had begun blotting out the sun, a thick, gray haze. They were all supposed to ignore things like that. A Russian megacorporation, Volga, had paid all the residents a hefty sum of money to turn a blind eye to the nuclear power plant they had built nearby. Everyone knew it was a bullshit story, but everyone also knew that their houses and cars were suddenly paid off so a little smoke was nothing. Until it was. The haze went from white gray to steel, and finally black, like an oncoming night. Then there was the glow, vermilion and feverish. It had started on the horizon, beautiful against the black backdrop. 
By the time the fire reached the town, her mother was frantically trying to load the car with their belongings. When she knew it was too late for that, she shoved Aegis, or Allie back then, into the car and tried to flee. But the streets were a wall of taillights, obscured by the smoke that was heavy in the air at that point. They could barely see, and in her panic, Aegis's mother had driven them into a ditch. She pulled her young daughter from the vehicle, had her lay in the soft grass. Then, her mother covered her body with her own, fully expecting to die. The fire burned 30% of the town, but Volga got there eventually and stopped the flash fire. Aegis and her mother survived, but not everyone did, and even the survivors were suffering from burns and smoke inhalation. Volga would have let them suffer and die. Aegis knew it in her heart. It only took hours, though, for the Radiant Mercy Corps to show up and start rendering aid. They had taken her from her mother's arms, cut her singed overalls off her, and spread a healing salve on her little legs. Little Allie remembered the cornflower blue of their uniform and the golden sunbursts on the right side of their chests. That memory was what made her want to be a medic in the first place. All she had wanted for the future was to be a savior, which made her eventual place within Umbral all the more strange. After university, she ended up with Radiant Mercy, just like she had wanted. But it wasn't long before she realized that it wasn't what she thought it would be. Aegis didn't find herself in burnt down towns or cities devastated by storms very often. Instead, she was on the battlefield, trying her damnedest to save any and every life she could. Even in the present day, she didn't know which one of her patients that Umbral wanted so badly. That night, when an early Eclipse Initiative team raided the medic tent, all she knew was that she fought to protect her people until the bitter end, making her last stand in front of field hospital beds full of people she didn't even know. Aegis was a terrible shot back then, but it was her spirit that made her desirable to Umbral. They had given her two choices. Join them, live, and they wouldn't burn Radiant Mercy to the ground. Or refuse, die, but watch the core that she had spent all her life working towards being a part of be utterly decimated first. So, Alicia joined Umbral and became Aegis. And now Aegis was in an underwater habitat at the bottom of the sea with her commander and a handful of wraiths. That and enough pressure to ground her down to her atomic structure if something went wrong. Aegis bent at the waist absent-mindedly rubbing the burn scar on her leg, and remembered. Sentinel felt out of sorts, and he was more than fucking ready to be done with Haven. But the passage of time didn't care what he wanted. Left with only Aegis, he noticed how different it felt, just being a team of two. It had been almost two decades since he had operated as a single soldier for Umbral, but he didn't feel like he had much to be leading with just his medic there with him. The choice on whether to stay or go had been one of the hardest he'd ever have to make as a commander, but there wasn't exactly a hard set rule for what to do when trapped in an underwater habitat with a bunch of cult members. So, he had given them all the best chance at survival, waiting with Aegis in case any of the Haven occupants needed medical care. He knew it was the right choice. Sleeping in the other room, with Aegis standing guard, were people. Sentinel couldn't help but see them as numbers and figures, though. Assets for Umbral. Important, fragile ones. But they were still people. He was... fucked in the head. But he already knew that. Like everything else, it barely registered with Sentinel emotionally. 
he was numb. But for the most part, that loyalty and drive for success that lived in him remained. Swift, efficient, and deadly, he was exactly what Umbril had raised him to be. It was a strange thing to be the son of a megacorporation, but he knew nothing else. Well, that wasn't quite true. There were fuzzy memories, an extravagant home, a bedroom with glowing stars on the ceiling, and the smell of a woman's perfume. And of course, his name. Nathaniel Delacroix. He never said it out loud, really. The words felt clumsy and foreign on his tongue. He had been Nathaniel for a scant few years, but he had been Sentinel much longer. Despite all of that, he wasn't a machine, even if rumors persisted that he was. He was a man, and as such, he had cooked before. He couldn't pinpoint why it felt so fucking stupid to do it now, though, standing over the ancient stove aboard Haven and flipping an omelette. It was probably the fact that he was still in full uniform, his rifle slung over his shoulder and shifting as he moved. When he dumped the first omelette on the plate, the clacking and jangling of his gear only made the surreal nature of it all even worse. But it was a little late at that point. He carried the ceramic plates, chipped and discolored from countless years of use, across the darkened chambers of Haven, through the scorched hole that Jester had cut in the door of the living quarters, and finally held up to his medic, who looked like she had never been more confused in her entire life. Which may have been true. Hell, Sentinel didn't know what Aegis had seen before she became part of his team. Apparently, Nothing as strange as her commander delivering her a plate. What is this? She asked, taking it gingerly from his hand. Sentinel kept a straight face. Omelet. Like... With eggs? He shrugged one shoulder. I found some powdered eggs in one of the storage closets near the cafeteria. There's, uh, peppers and tomatoes, too. Aegis blinked at him, looked down at the plate again, and then she smiled. I never figured you for a chef, sir. It's just eggs. With that, Aegis barked a laugh so loudly that she instantly covered her mouth with her free hand. She looked around to make sure she hadn't woken any of the Haven occupants. Sorry, she whispered. I think I'm going insane down here. You and me both, Sentinel sighed, and then lowered himself to the ground, waiting for Aegis to follow suit. Sitting on the floor, Sentinel and Aegis ate. When she emptied her canteen, he handed her his so she didn't have to get up to refill it. The commander and the medic talked, long minutes about nothing. It was camaraderie, and like his name, it felt foreign to Sentinel. But he didn't mind it. Wait until I tell the rest of the team about this, Aegis sighed when she finished. All Sentinel said was, no. Only just as then. He narrowed his eyes at her. Hell no. And that's an order. Aegis waved her hand dismissively, leaning back against the wall and stretching her legs out in front of her. Fine. I wouldn't want to ruin your spotless reputation. After a moment, he mirrored her sitting position, folding his hands behind his head. I don't like the thought of the team I'm in command of gossiping enough that I have a reputation among all of you. It's not like that. You're just... You. Other Eclipse teams joke that you were made in a lab. You're so good at your job. It isn't a bad thing. Sentinel grunted in acknowledgement, and is quiet for a few moments before speaking again. Not in a lab, but Umbril did raise me. He didn't turn in her direction, but he could see that she was looking at him when she replied. What does that mean? 
just what it sounds like. When I was a kid, six years old I think, my father embezzled some money from the corporation he was working for. We were well off, I guess. This was in the early days of the worldwide corporate takeover, so there were still smaller corporations trying to, you know, scratch their way to the top. The one my father worked for, Interlink Enterprises, isn't around anymore. But at that time, they were powerful enough to make him regret every move he ever made against them. Holy shit. Aegis sounded stunned. <laughs> yeah. It was sheer dumb luck that Umbral showed up to try and overtake the Interlink strike team at our estate. To get intel, I'm assuming. One of them must have had a soft spot or something, because I was almost dead when they brought me in. I've been with Umbral ever since. I... Aegis paused, rubbing a hand over her face. I shouldn't have made a joke. I'm sorry. Don't be, he told her. I was a stupid kid as I got older. Reckless. Umbral gave me structure. A home. Education. It could have been worse. She didn't seem convinced, and he could feel her eyes burning into him, until the medic finally faced forward again and closed her eyes. Yeah. I guess it could have been. Sentinel didn't know why he had just told her those things. It was out of character for him. But in the soft, dark quiet of Haven, without a team in danger or an enemy, it felt... normal. Sentinel could also sense, though, that Aegis didn't know what to think of his confession. So he guided the conversation away from it. You know... Mariner was the same as I am. Aegis made a small noise of surprise. Really? Everything about him screamed... Civilian to me. He was older when they brought him in. But still a kid. Twelve, I think. He was an orphan-turned-free-diving prodigy. Poor bastard. Is it bad that it makes me feel a little less guilty to know that? She almost whispered, as if anyone else could hear the two of them. He doesn't have a family out there wondering about him. I mean, a family before Umbral, of course. Of course, Sentinel echoed. Neither of them mentioned their own family that might still be out there, wondering where Elisa and Nathaniel disappeared to. He knew her story, because he was her commander. He'd seen the missing person flyer and the picture of the curly-haired, blonde 18-year-old on it, in her file. Someone missed Aegis out there in the world, but she would never be allowed to know. Sentinel felt... bad about that. Something about Aegis brought that out in him. Emotions. Just brief glimpses of them. Maybe it was her spirit that still burned in her like a never-smothered ember, or the way she felt some things so strongly that it bled over to the other members of the team. A hazard, really. Something he should have reported and snuffed out. But it reminded him of the ghost of who he might have been. Like the pain pleasure of a lance, infected wound. He liked it more than he should. He remembered how she had furiously demanded to Raptor that he survive. His personal opinion was that Aegis had forced Raptor to live, and it was the only reason he was still breathing. Not quite alive, but not dead either. Aegis had watched death steal Cypher away, and with the sheer force of her will, had pried the Reaper's fingers apart to take Raptor back. If it ever endangered any other Ares member, he'd handle it. But for the moment, he let Aegis rage, laugh, and mourn. Sentinel pretended like he hadn't heard Tempest mourning with the medic, days ago, through Aegis's apartment door. What he couldn't ignore, though, 
was the damned rift in his team. But the long hours he spent down in Haven with his medic told him that she, at least, wasn't the origin of said rift. That would make it a little easier to figure it out and make them whole again. They didn't sit there on the floor much longer, rising up and retaking their positions guarding the sleeping survivors for the last hours of their ocean floor vigil. The night cycle in the habitat ended and the day cycle began. Sentinel and Aegis let them complete their usual morning rituals and he found himself more ambial towards the sad group. It was during the Haven inhabitants' group breakfast that the structure shuddered, and they heard the unmistakable clunk of something docking with the habitat. Relief snapped through him. Ares had made it to the surface, and sent down the rescue crew. The survivors, though, looked terrified. Sentinel was a leader, and he would lead these lost souls to the surface. And then, once he had ground under his feet, he would lead Ares home, just like he always did. <laughs>